Molly is a device that helps surgeons remove lesions in all types of soft tissue with unprecedented precision. Molly measures the distance between the wand and the magnetic Molly marker placed within or around the target tissue. Without the need for a cumbersome console, Molly is highly portable and accessible to health systems of all sizes. In this video, we will outline the steps of a Molly guided lumpectomy. The Molly marker, just 3.2 millimeters in size, is a small, solid magnet that can't be deactivated and has no signal decay. The Molly marker is placed within the breast instead of a wire, using ultrasound imaging or other placement technologies such as mammography. As compared to other clips and markers, the Molly marker is easily visualized in radiological imaging. Placement usually takes about five minutes and can be done on the same day or up to 30 days before surgery. Decoupling radiology and surgery facilitates the surgical plan for optimal cosmesis, provides easier booking, improved OR efficiency, and a better overall patient experience. On the day of surgery, the surgeon and the surgical assistant prepare the Molly wand and the system. A Molly guided lumpectomy takes place in a standard operating room. With the patient under anesthetic, the surgeon uses the Molly wand to locate the Molly marker inside the tumor before making an incision. The Molly tablet tells the surgeon the distance to the Molly marker through real time audio and visual feedback options. The surgeon begins to excise the tumor. The magnetic Molly marker is easily located by the Molly wand while using standard metal instruments and operating equipment. Throughout the procedure, the surgeon dynamically uses the Molly wand to verify the location of the magnetic Molly marker in real time. The streamlined 10 mm tip and 10 degree curve of the Molly wand help access and work in tight surgical cavities. Molly's precise measurement helps the surgeon to excise the tumor with the accuracy needed for optimal surgical outcomes. After the surgeon removes the tumor, the team uses the Molly wand once more to verify the marker has been retrieved in the excised tissue. The surgeon may also measure the location of the marker inside the excised tissue to help verify that the margins are adequate. The tumor may then be x-rayed to check the location of the Molly marker and further verify the margins. The tumor is then taken to the pathology lab. Because the magnetic Molly marker is not radioactive, it can easily be removed from the tumor and disposed of as biological waste with no risk to staff. Molly makes precision surgery simpler. If you have questions or want to learn more, please contact us. Welcome back to another episode of MedTech Trends. I'm your host, Dorian. Uh, so today we've got a really exciting pair of guests today. They're coming from uh, Molly Surgical. So today we're going to be talking to uh, Fazila Seeker. She's the CEO and co-founder of Molly Surgical. And this is a company that develops medical devices uh, to guide precision surgeries for a better patient experience. We also have co-founder Anant Ravi. He's also the chief science and clinical officer. Now Anant has uh, a very uh, broad history. Uh, he's been publishing a peer reviewed research for, for many years, uh, focused on image guidance for medical procedures, uh, ranging from radiation to surgical oncology techniques. He's also co-inventor on numerous patents and he's got, garnered quite a few patents over the years. And he's an award winning patient advocate. Uh, patient advocacy, of course, is one of the focuses that we have on this channel. So really glad to, to have that perspective uh, into this conversation. So welcome both. Really glad to have you both on today. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Thanks for having us. Awesome. So now Molly uh, Surgical, uh, just to give everybody a little bit of background and context before we dive into, uh, you know, what the company is and, and how it works and where things are today. It is uh, providing cutting edge magnetic technology uh, to provide breast cancer patients with a better experience over traditional wire and other lesion localization options. And it helps surgeons to remove the lesions uh, with quite a bit of efficiency, uh, much greater accuracy and specificity uh, than I believe was possible before, and cost effectiveness is a big factor here as well. Uh, they have two parts to their first product. It's the Molly Wand and the Molly Marker, and both of them have actually gained FDA clearance and Health Canada registration. Really interesting technology that you guys have brought to life uh, through this venture. 
really exciting stuff. So one of the things I wanted to ask right off the bat, how did the company actually get started? Yeah, I, I think I can, I can feel that one given that um, it happened while I was just a newly minted physicist at, at Sunnybrook and at Cancer Center. I was looking to start out my lab and I was building out my lab, um, doing a lot of applied engineering to solve the needs of patients within Sunnybrook Hospital. And at that time, I was looking for talent to help me do this and build these devices. And I found a gifted young innovator in John Dillon, who became our chief technology officer um, and has been with me as a partner for a, a really long time now, <laughs> it's like too many years to count. But during this time, we kept making technologies and we found them in fact and we saw them change the lives of patients within Sunnybrook and the impact that it would have. And we wanted to have a, a larger impact and how do we get the technology out of just Sunnybrook into a broader community. And that's where you need someone with that outside view to do that sniff test of, will this work outside the confines and is there value to doing this in a, in a, a larger scale? And that's where we met Basila in one of these technology incubators in Toronto and she was amazing. She provided us that outside brutal but truthful um, advice when some ideas just had no legs to them. She was honest about it. And that compliment between John, myself, and Fazla has been amazing. And we've been together since those early days. There's been ups and downs and challenges, but every challenge we face has, has really brought us closer together. So, you know, we've been through a lot and it's going to be exciting to see what the future holds for us. And uh, correct me if I'm, uh, if I'm off here, but I believe the company uh, initially kind of started in conception. Maybe, maybe there were some ideas before this, but 2019 or so was kind of the, the founding of the company. Is that right? 2018. 2018. That's over three years now. Yes. Yeah, three three years, and actually a lot of progress has been made in the meantime. And and I'm also curious that you know the the initial idea, the conception. This was. Um, there must have been like this initial need, right? I mean, so uh, breast cancer, uh, you know, treatments and, and diagnostic procedures have been around for, for a long time. A lot of hospitals actually specialize in this, but obviously there was some kind of unmet need. There was a problem uh, that was facing uh, clinicians and patients at the same time. Um, so I'm wondering, like, what, you know, what was the root of the, the problem to begin with? No, it's, a, it's a great question. And then like all truly impactful medical innovations that comes from that, that essence, that, that patient need that needs to be addressed. And the origin story of Molly is no exception. In fact, it started with, um, with patient advocacy. They wanted a different experience. They wanted a better solution to um, lesion localization or, or breast localization techniques. And so it, it originated and I was privileged to be a part of the discussion with a patient family advisory council where a patient told us the story of coming in the morning and she was having a wire procedure. She'd come in the morning, have this hooked wire placed. And prior to that, because she has to have surgery subsequently, she had to, she, she was fasting all night before. She'd come in, get this hooked wire placed in radiology first thing in the morning. And then she had to wait um, continuously fasting and she was uncomfortable and she was waiting for the surgical OR to open up. And that wait was, she was there's a lot of anxiety, there's discomfort. You can imagine just waiting there. And then when the surgery opened up, she went and had her procedure, but it's, it, the whole thing took six to eight hours to complete. And she was talking about this event and I was, I was just struck by there's gotta be a better way to do this that alleviates the anxiety associated with having multiple procedures on the same day if you have to and then also the discomfort of these patients. So we took that back and at a, at a barbecue, the VP of the Cancer Center challenged myself and Dr. Nicole Lukong, who's a surgeon at Sunnybrook to come up with a better strategy, come up with a better solution that will eliminate these concerns for these patients. And so that it's through that patient advocacy, um, speaking for themselves will be that, that Molly originated. Now, one of the things I think that struck me about this story and why, why I really wanted to have this conversation with both of you, uh, it, it's the impact on, on the patient experience. So you pointed out, um, obviously, it was a big problem for, for people to actually go in and have all these things happen um, all on the same day at the same time. Uh, there's anxiety associated with that as well. I mean, you're, kind of, you're waiting for, for things to happen. Um, it's, there's a lot of discomfort. And, uh, and you're right, there had to be a better way to actually approach this, this problem. Um, so, you know, the, the idea kind of came into the, the picture and then you guys got to work uh, developing something. 
And um, I, I wonder if you can take me through that process because on the, on the one hand, there's a, a lot of people have high ideas, of course, and so not all of them actually make it into development phase. Um, but uh, you know, how did you kind of make that transition? How do you get to the point where you realize that, yes, we have something that could potentially really work? Um, how do we think about actually developing it into something that could be commercialized and really used in, in a real practice? Yeah, so that was very much part of my role when I met uh, John and Ananth uh, through my role at uh, an accelerator in Toronto, where I was heading up the medical devices division there at the time. And uh, I, I also just want to say that the just the environment here in Toronto, I think, was um, really important in terms of that success factor um, for setting us up to be successful, because as Ananth already described, Molly came about because of a frontline clinical experience and hearing directly from patients. And that's a lot that those are the kinds of problems that I would look for when I was choosing where I was going to be taking um, my time and my team's time at the time at that point there um, for, you know, putting our energy and resources into developing things into um, whether it's commercializable or not in any kind of near term time frame because there's already a need that's been identified. And it's top research hospitals like Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. They're such a terrific source of medical inventions um, that come about from that frontline clinical experience. And Toronto is just such a great hotbed of med tech innovation. So we had that going for us. And I've always said that, um, and I think we all know this in this community, your audience here, is that there's a lot of great ideas, but an idea isn't going to go anywhere unless you have the right people behind it. And so what, what I quickly saw is that this was not only an A technology, but also an A team behind it. And what made us a really great team that Anath talked to about a little bit already is that each of us had our own unique strengths and we knew where our strengths began and ended. And so when we were presented with challenges, just like any innovator's dilemma, um, when you're coming out with something new, you'll have a hundred people tell you why it won't work and why you won't be successful. And instead of us pointing fingers at each other and blowing up, um, that can happen often and why a lot of ideas don't actually come to be, we actually pulled in tighter together because we respected each other's strengths. And that was that chemistry, that team that was so important. Um, and I think that those are really two of the biggest success factors in why and how we actually went about and embarked on this. It, it takes having that trust in the people you're going to work with to be able to bring uh, an innovation like this to reality. Well, you, you also would have had to go through quite a few iterations to actually get this thing um, up and running and, and to get a prototype in place. And um, along the way, being in a hospital setting and also uh, in an environment, like you said, where you have a lot of innovation focused people and um, they're acting on questions and problems that are coming directly from clinical teams. So uh, along the way, um, was there like, who were some of the folks that you were working with to try to get that feedback right away in terms of what um, what could actually make a lot of sense in clinical practice versus uh, something that is um, great in theory, but is not really going to work in clinical practice? Were there some KOLs in place, some key clinicians at, uh, at Sunnybrook that were part of this development? So during that early stage of iterating through the product development, it's absolutely, and this is where trust that, that Fazl speaks to is, you know, you want that brutal, honest feedback when something just doesn't feel right or you're over-engineering the solution. And that's one of the main design ethos of Molly is make sure it's simple, make sure it's reliable, make sure you de-risk the, the clinical care pathway that you're trying to solve and improve. And so with those questions in mind, we would engage as it's not just one KOL or one, we would engage as many people that were part of that, that treatment care pathway. Um, as long as they were close and in the vicinity of the care pathway and were touching it, we would ask their opinion. And through that brutal, honest feedback, you get to improve and iterate with the view to how can I make this easier to use and more reliable always. And you're constantly trying to prune off the excess, but give the minimum viable experience that is just going to be stellar for not only the patient, but also the, the surgeon and the care team. And I'll just add to that, that one of the very first challenges that I put to the team when they came forward and when we, that moment when we first met and they presented the concepts at very, very early prototype and some um, early discussions that they had had with their immediate clinical team at Sunnybrook, 
I said, that's great, but I got to know that um, people outside of the walls of Sunnybrook are going to care about this. And so um, have you, have you um, tested out your idea with people outside of Sunnybrook? And that was one of the very first challenges I put to the team. So through um, their network and also through our network where I was at, um, we started introductions to um, some other um, surgeons and care teams and uh, started to look at putting together really just more of a, a feedback mechanism of surveys. And then we then iterated and took that to a next level where we started to engage with, okay, so we got a pretty good idea within the Toronto environment. Now, how does this um, feedback in across the border? So let's go look at, you know, um, you know, you move from your friends and family to then people who don't know you at all. And that's the true test. And we took those same questions and started surveying people and showing the early prototype um, through just working our networks and connections in the U.S. and meeting breast surgeons uh, in the U.S. that way. And, and we just kept getting um, more and more um, consistent feedback that we really have something here. And that really started to solidify that we've got the right design. We actually had, through some of that feedback, um, really great feedback that helped simplify the design further. And that was always the intent um, to, you know, a technology should be there to help to help the surgeons and the care teams. And the care teams shouldn't be the ones having to create workarounds to make the technology work for them. It should just be a seamless extension of their natural expertise and um, medical skill set. Great segue, because I, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, let's uh, let's turn to how exactly the, the product is used in in real practice. And I'm wondering if we can get kind of two perspectives here. So on the one hand, uh, uh, from what I've read, there's huge benefit to the actual workflow uh, process itself. And there's also, of course, a huge benefit to clinicians using these uh, using the device and to patients as well. So I wonder if we can kind of touch on those two perspectives, um, maybe starting with the the workflow. So what what are some of the advantages of using Molly um, in clinical practice from a workflow perspective? So this is a very pertinent question there, Dorian, especially in the times of the pandemic. Um, so at Molly, we're, we're focused on making the breast cancer experience simpler for patients and providers. It's not, it's, it, you have to work on everybody in concert because it is very much collaborative. Mm -hmm. So the standard of care is wire, as we mentioned, where the patient faces discomfort, uncertainty, anxiety, right? They're going through two procedures on the same day and they have to deal with all of that stress with the placement of surgery in the morning and the placement of the wire in the morning and surgery in the afternoon. But what is not captured in that story that's, is that the care team also has to deal with any kind of hiccup that might happen. So if there's something that happens in radiology that delays the patient. Well, you could delay the, the surgical procedure significantly. And what's happening now with COVID-19 is that patient's in the hospital for six to eight hours. And the number of personnel that she's interacting with or he's interacting with is substantial. And you have to maintain care for that patient over that period of time. And why is this important? Well, you know, with the pandemic, providers are stuck dealing with this massive backlog of patients because COVID-19 shut down ORs. We see kind of a resurgence now with the fourth wave. So it is, it is here. It's going to be a part of our care moving forward. So we need methods to really improve the efficiency of delivery of care. And Molly just does that. And the way, the way it does that is, you know, I, I like to think of breast conserving surgery as a three-legged tool, stool, where you have radiology, you have surgery, and your pathology, each of them playing their parts. And the stool stands up perfectly if everybody is doing exactly what they're doing and everything goes just right. If something goes a little bit askew, that stool could collapse and then the care continuum is affected. And so the idea by using Molly and decoupling surgery from radiology, meaning like the, the, the patient could have the implant on the same day if they choose or on another day, um, radiology can optimize their workflow, how they suit, see, see fit to see as many cases as possible, but it doesn't have to interfere with surgery plans and they can optimize their schedule as possible. And, and in this way, the patient, the patient has autonomy over their schedule. They can pick, I want a booking on this day because my life is priority and I will choose when I can have these procedures. So you're giving autonomy to each of these disciplines and the care team, as well as the pro providers, to arrange your schedules, optimize them, 
And one of the, the, the ideas that Molly Surgical has and, and we, we, we take pride in is that we really are about providing a holistic partnership with our customers to make sure that not only do they know how to use the device, but incorporate it systematically. And so we will hold their hands through the implementation to make sure that they get the operational efficiencies and programmatic change that's required to really ride out the storm and backlog of, of patients. So that's kind of the more system-wide clinical impact and operations um, um, for, for the Molly system. And there's quite a bit to unpack from uh, and not from what you mentioned there. A lot of details that I wanted to touch on. Um, and one of the other uh, pieces that I'm, I'm really interested in and I was surprised to hear about is, I mean, the device is a, it, it's a, it's a novel, it's a cutting edge device. So we're talking potentially about something that can replace the current standard of care. Uh, where the standard of care is is either wire wire guided um, a lesion removal or uh, there's a radiation uh, alternative uh, to that. Uh, but the the Molly uh, device, so um, there's two pieces to it. Again, there's the implantable uh, marker, and then there's also the actual uh, wand, the Molly wand. I love the, that you named it that, and. So these are comp these are based on uh, magnetic resonance. These are completely outside of the, the realm of radiation. So for any hospitals where that's still kind of the standard, um, it can completely remove that as uh, the standard. Is that uh, part of the picture as well? Absolutely. I mean, if you'd like, I could do a little bit of a demo and show and tell, and like we can, we can talk about it a little bit further. But at the present standard, you're absolutely right. There is the the idea that we had was to just eliminate all of the burden associated with migrating to a wire-free technology. And so the burden of adoption and learning a new technique, we want to eliminate so it becomes easier to use. And so, you know, the present standard of care is wire, patient has a wire sticking out of their breast, undergoes two procedures the same day, they're anxious dis and, and uncomfortable. And Molly does away with all of that. And so the way we, we what we focused on for Molly was the Molly marker. It starts with the Molly marker. Um, and, and I have it here, and I hope you can see it as I zoom in and maybe let it focus. There we go. So just to give you an idea of scale, and this is my, this, this, is, this morning I put this together with my kid's glue, um, so forgive me. But on one side, so the white is a tiny little sesame seed, and that's the molly marker, right? And the molly marker is a permanent magnet. So it's, again, a fundamental, like, part of nature, like your frig mag fridge magnet's never gonna fall off the fridge spontaneously. It is always on. You can never deactivate it. You have this confidence that if it's in the, if it's in the breast, if it's in the lesion, the surgeon's gonna be able to remove it. So that was the fundamental, but because it's so tiny, there's nothing protruding from the breast. So you implant it and both the providers and the patient can now have that autonomy of schedule, like I mentioned earlier. But to your point as well, it's a magnet there's no real safety concerns in terms of having to do sort of any additional safety administration around it. You can place it in there and discard it once you're done and the surgery is, is, is complete. So I'll keep, so that's the, the, the marker and we built everything off the marker because we wanted a technology that was just gonna always work and provide confidence to the surgeon knowing that if it's in there, I'm gonna be able to find it. But on top of that, we, we created a tablet and a wand and we, we, we call it a wand because we say a little bit of tongue in cheek that the magic is in the wand. And that's why we call it the Molly wand. Um, and I have this little cube here and it has, a, it has a marker in there, so I'll show you. But the idea here is the tablet and wand were created with the surgeon in mind for ease of use. So there's three modes of feedback and the surgeon uses the wand like a GPS. So they'll take the wand, they'll put it on the surface of the breast and they can move it in and out. You can hear the, there's an audio feedback there's a graphical feedback. And on top of it, what surgeons do like, and I don't know if it's coming across, but there is a, a distance feedback in millimeters. So it'll, you can use it as a GPS, measuring the distance from the marker to the tip of the wand. And it's, so the beauty of this is, is it's, it's just the overall system is designed to give that care team that confidence without complexity and, and, and as Fazla alluded to, without compromise. It just will fit into their overarching system and how, how they do things. Pretty awesome to see and, and appreciate the uh, the demo on there as well. Uh, now, of course, one of the uh, the big uh, components of this and, and part of the the pitch, if you will, is going to be um, it 
can be used in place of the current uh, uh, methods and offer the same level of accuracy and precision um, or, or perhaps uh, even better. Uh, and I wonder if we can speak to that a little bit. These are, the device itself has been approved by FDA and, and by Health Canada. So obviously to go through that regulatory process, you have to offer quite a bit of evidence. I wonder if we can touch a little bit on, um, you know, what, what studies have been done uh, and uh, just some high level kind of outcomes here uh, that can kind of uh, talk a little bit to, to the accuracy and how it actually works in clinical practice. Right. So, I mean, we've spent a lot of time and the, the FDA, for those who have gone through the FDA process is, is quite significant. The burden of evidence you have to show in terms of getting our 510k clearance. But a lot of the work was also done at Sunnybrook as well. And we had, uh, it had culminated in a pilot study where we demonstrated in that pilot study 100% marker retrieval um, for all of our cases. And on top of that, 100% of the tumors were also recovered. Um, and those are metrics that are absolutely important to the patient. Patients want to know that, you know, you're getting the tumor out and you're giving them the best possible cosmesis for themselves. Um, and so that was that in addition to this kind of extensive burden of evidence. And the one thing about our device is it's quite complex. There's, there's an implantable device, there's an electrical component. And so there's an there's a, there's a immense FDA regulatory burden that's placed to make sure that our device is safe and effective. And so we're finally excited to have this cleared um, not only in, in, in the US, but also in Canada. Um, okay. But what we're more interested in now is the future, like the future studies with, with our device. And so I think parts of that is going to be related to, we're really looking forward to, and, and that's part of my role as a clinical um, lead is to engage with these care providers on studies to help elevate the standard of care for everyone. And you talked about patient advocacy. But one of the big pieces there is to ensure that we can elevate it to wire-free localization for everyone and help to eliminate and looking how do we eliminate barriers of access due to different socioeconomic um, disparities. So that, and obviously we're always looking for studies on, for new ideas and innovative technologies that, that can help make you know, precision healthcare simpler. And I do want to come back to the topic of uh, expanding access to, to the device itself across uh, uh, north and south of <laughs> the Canada-US border uh, because it has approval in, in uh, both jurisdictions. Um, so I would love to hear about your your, your plans, if you will, uh, uh, for, for expanding to, to other centers. Um, but for a second, I, I do want to try to play devil's advocate to a little bit here. Um, Obviously, anytime you're introducing a brand new medical device, there's always going to be some kind of resistance or, uh, you know, folks are going to have questions about whether, you know, the extent to which it works or the extent to which it's practical, that sort of thing. So I wonder if you guys can speak a little bit to, um, have you received any, any feedback, any questions um, from clinicians that are maybe hesitant to, to give it a shot or hesitant about how uh, it might work in their practice? Great question there, Dorian, because we just received, this spring we received FDA clearance. Um, and, and, and we got our, our, we were registered in Health Canada and to, to sell in Canada. And the response actually has been tremendous. There is such great enthusiasm and we're working through a long list of hospitals and cancer centers on both sides of the border that have kind of queued up to begin using Molly. Um, and so we have some testimonials on our website, but repeatedly what I've heard directly from a number of surgeons is it's, it's, it's really easy to use. It's easier than I thought. And I get it, it's intuitive and simple. And this is the, when I hear these, I'm like, this is great. Like, this is great feedback for, for what we want. And one of the big pieces of feedback that we do hear is the distance readings. Um, it means that they don't have to take really large incisions and it gives them confidence that they can reduce the amount of normal tissue around the tumor. And one of them said, it, it's going to improve my practice. So it's really been, there's not been a lot of hesitance because I think, what Molly does is we, we're building on the confidence of localization. So we're building upon what everybody already accepts is safe and effective. And we're just in, enhancing that experience for both patient and care team alike. I don't know if Fazla, if you had anything to add there. I think you said it well. I think that for us, it's just been tremendous to see that what was originally envisioned and was just seen and demonstrated at one site at Sunnybrook we're now hearing, you know, the device is now out in the wild, so to speak. It's outside of um, any kind of controlled use environment. And we're hearing exact uh, the feedback 
that it was exactly designed to do. It's just easy to use, it's intuitive, and it's better than what they were using before. And they really like that distance measurement. For anyone taking a look at uh, Molly Surgical, one of the things you'll see, the company has been growing quite a bit. Um, of course, uh, the, the regulatory approvals uh, that have been granted are, are, are one of the first key steps to that. Um, and, uh, and of course, they're going to be a big marker to the positive outlook in the company. Um, so this is fantastic to hear. And uh, I love that the part of the goal, it sounds like, is to expand into more and more centers, uh, both in Canada and the U.S., I wonder if we can uh, dive into that a little bit at this point. Um, so uh, what are you thinking in terms of uh, growing to uh, other regions, other provinces uh, in Canada or um, in the U.S. Uh, to, to certain hospital systems, uh, let's say that are major cancer treatment centers? Um, is that part of the goal or would you be going into um, uh, general hospitals? Is, is, there, is there a place for the, the Molly uh, wand uh, in those centers as well? Well, I mean, we're North America wide right now. We've launched North America wide, coast to coast, Canada and the U.S. And uh, we are seeing their opportunity and real interest, not only from the large hospitals, but also the smaller community um, hospitals, cancer centers, and also within the U.S. setting, um, ambulatory surgical centers. So in terms of, you know, is there a particular sweet spot? Are we only focusing on one um, part of the market in North America, no, we're going wherever the need is. And that's what it was developed for. But we are um, focused on North America at the moment. Can you give us a, a sense of how many hospital systems are using it at the moment? Yeah, so so in addition to the, the pilot study conducted in Sunnybrook and their adoption of it and their, their student use of it, we have, and, and bear in mind, we just recently got clear, but we already have five additional centers on both sides of the border. Um, that are actively taking care of their patients with Molly. So uh, very selfishly, I'm really happy to see that the technology that we built in Sunnybrook now is fabulous. is out in the wild. We re it's not under our control anymore, but it's standing up and it's performing what we asked it to perform. And it's helping a lot more patients than if we just stayed within the walls of Sunnybrook. So that, that reach and that impact we're having is so rewarding to see. Really great to hear about that as well. Anand, you mentioned a little bit about uh, the fact that during the COVID period, there's obviously been a huge backlog of, of surgical uh, procedures. And I think at one point, um, a, a lot of uh, systems were basically advising, you know, unless it's a, um, a, a critical procedure, basically don't, like it has to be rescheduled or postponed or just not happen uh, essentially at all. So, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand also, you know, how is there a, a way in which, um, this new device that improves, um, the, has a major impact on clinical workflows. And is there an opportunity also to address some of that backlog uh, in a more efficient way, um, maybe faster than would have been possible uh, using traditional uh, approaches? Yeah, absolutely, right? So COVID has caused such a large backlog in surgeries, as you mentioned with the shutdown of elective um, procedures. And it actually resulted in 44% of breast cancer patients delaying their cancer treatment. And that includes 30% postponing critical treatments like lumpectomies, where Molly um, is meant to be used. And as a result, just again, to paint the picture of how important uh, and, how, and how critical a problem that COVID has created here, the U.S. alone is going to be experiencing six to 10,000 excess deaths from breast and colorectal cancers alone over the next decade. And those are the two most common cancers. And, um, and it's because of delays in cancer screenings and treatment. So that's what really made the need for medical technologies like Molly more urgent by helping to get more patients the care that they need quickly. For example, to give you an idea of what kind of improvement it can provide, studies on benefits of wire-free technology have shown a 34% increase in radiology scheduling capacity and a 41% increase in breast conserving surgery programs. Um, uh, uh, for their capacity. So you can see how the efficiencies in that three-legged stool being able to work at its optimum best, as opposed to leaning on one another, like what uh, Anant described earlier, um, how that helps tremendously in being able to um, provide more patients uh, the opportunity to get the care they need more quickly. Those are pretty fantastic stats, actually. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's about, like I mentioned, the ability to decouple between um, between radiology and surgery. But in order to create that, that operational efficiency and that capacity, 
really, I think industry and Molly surgical prides herself is you need to form a partnership and that relationship with each site and help them through reorganizing radiology and surgical flow such that they can find that added capacity. And there's ways to do that through restructuring. But now given with everything and all the care providers are dealing with, they, just, they may not internally have that bandwidth. So we've taken that on and we're trying to help guide them through that process and deliver, we like to call it localization plus and plus being that additional um, service to help them really operationalize the benefits of something like what Molly. You know, let's say hypothetically a, a brand new center uh, is interested in uh, using uh, the, the Molly uh, wand and, um, and the device itself. So uh, can you take me through that process of how would you uh, go about kind of implementing this new technology uh, into, into their hospital uh, system? What would that look like? And I don't think you mentioned this earlier, but uh, there's a training component associated with this as well. So you really kind of walk through uh, a new like hospital system or a new uh, set of providers uh, through the whole process, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think part of this is we really focused heavily on the user experience. And so with, with, with training specifically, our intense focus on simplicity has really allowed us to offer the technology with minimal startup. And, and Basla mentioned this earlier, it's really the way we designed it, we wanted it to be an extension of the team's intuitive skills and intuitive knowledge. So we wanted to really be plug and play. Um, so while we, we provide training and how to use the technology, we want to go well beyond that. I think, yes, we will in all means go in there. And it's not just talking to a surgeon, it's not just talking to a radiologist, it's the whole team. And we recognize that you know, care is delivered not by individuals, but by the, the efficient execution by an entire team of multidisciplinary stellar staff, right? So it's that component where doing even just in-servicing and training, we're talking to every single disciplinary group within the organization. But on top of just training how to use it and how to take care of the device and sterilize and reprocess, we're also following up with how do you plan on implementing this? What is the flow of patients through your entire program? Are there, would you consider adopting different changes? What are your pain points? Maybe their pain points isn't that they have a giant backlog or maybe their pain points is just around patient experience. Well, you could measure patient experience. So we've got a number of avenues there to have this consultative approach to really enhance the experience um, of care providers as well as patients alike. I, I just want to emphasize one of the things that I have really you know, give kudos to the team on is and something I like to say is that we've worked hard. And, and when I say that, really, the engineering team has worked hard to take the work out for the care teams. And so it isn't so much about training around the device, because there's been a lot of work that's gone into taking out that training. It's more about what everything that Ananth was describing is customizing the experience to the particular program's objectives, what their particular pain points are, their operational environments, and understanding that and helping them to transition. Because WIRE is a very different clinical workflow, like what we talked about. And so if that's all that um, a, um, a care team has been working in, they've set up all their operational infrastructure out of what's uh, around something that's really not a very efficient system. And to move away from that so that you can truly take advantage of all of the benefits that a wire-free technology that Molly provides. Um, it really takes that getting in and understanding what the customer and what, uh, what that care team, what their objectives are, um, what their pain points are, and, um, and, try and looking to really optimize their operations when they start to move away from wire to wire-free Molly. The clinical workflow impact is, uh, is still resonating in my mind in terms of like, this could have a huge impact. And, and of course, you guys have, have already uh, documented this and, and studied this uh, quite a bit. And, uh, you know, since the, the product has been on the market for uh, a little while now, uh, I'm wondering, are you, are you getting... Only a few months. I just want okay. to... Okay. All right. Let me, let me... <laughs> That's a good point. All right. Not that long. <laughs> okay, gotcha. All right, uh, but but also uh, you know at the same time still generating quite a bit of buzz and um, and it's just awesome to see this actually come to life and being used uh, already in, in major uh, major hospitals and major centers. Um, I'm wondering, you know, are, are you already at the point of there are hospitals and, and clinicians that are coming to Molly Surgical, the company, uh, to look for solutions? 
um, or are you guys still very much in a phase of uh, trying to get the word out there? We're really seeing both. And that's what's really exciting. I mean, we're even getting requests coming in through our info um, at Molly Surgical on our website, um, asking for, hey, I heard about Molly. I'd love to have you guys come in and um, give our care team a demo. So uh, I'm particularly pleased that in only three or four months that we've been on the market, that at the reception that we're seeing, um, at the interest, the enthusiasm. So both are happening. Awesome to hear, for sure. Let's let's see if we can take this uh, as a case study kind of approach. So at, at Sunnybrook, um, you know what um, what was the the process to actually get this into into clinical practice? How, how much um, how much of a of a process is it to uh, switch out, if you will, uh, the current standard of care, um, and then also to actually uh, fund uh, implementing the device into practice as well? The implementation, I will say. Because I was at, at Sunnybrook and I helped with other wire-free transitions. The implementation was, because there's no administration, there's no other safety precautions and multidisciplinary groups that you really have to like worry about safety issues. The implementation was very simple. It's talking to them about how to use the device. And so, again, it's that really white glove experience of talking to each of the groups that would be a part of the care continuum and not just talking to the key champions, which is the surgeon and the radiologist. We, so we talked with the entire care team in radiology, all of the medical imaging technologists, as well as the radiologists in surgery, all of the nurses, the reprocessing techs, and, and really talked about not so much, yes, how to use the device, but again, we spent a lot of time taking the complexity out there, but it's about how do you integrate it into your flow? And Again, the resounding feedback is this is simple, this is intuitive, which is fantastic because then their adoption was really quick and really immediate. It was just about making sure that they are aware of the transition and then helping them guide through the transition. The other part about that systematic programmatic efficiencies gain, that takes more effort. And this is where we want to differentiate ourselves because this is where we think we can help providers by providing them the bandwidth to make these very impactful, very powerful programmatic scenes. And that's where I see Molly Surgical being different from a lot of our competitors out there. Could you also uh, give us a sense of, uh, you know, what is, is there a, a cost savings opportunity here uh, in addition to improving patient uh, experiences and clinical workflows? Again, this is around the cost of wire procedures are not just the disposable. And I think that's, some, that's a concept that we intuitively know in medicine, that there is this incredible value equation. This is, we have to be, and, and, and Molly originated in Toronto, in Sunnybrook, under, in, in Canada. So the health system there is already very tuned to you know, a public player system. So value is incorporated into everything you build. But you can't look at things in terms of the cost of the disposable. The value equation is based off of the overall impact on the system. And this is where all the inefficiencies introduced with a wire procedure and the patient being in hospital for six hours and having teams take care of it. There have been a number of studies that show that a wire-free transition actually saves institutions significant amount of money, significant amount of funds and resources from going to a wire-free solution like Molly. So there is a definite financial uh, benefit to the pair of providers and health systems, in addition to the safety and the confidence and autonomy. So there's a number of really key benefits to moving towards a, a wire free localization, such as Molly. I'm also really curious is still kind of staying on that point too, when you're speaking to uh, customers, hospital systems, providers in Canada versus the U S uh, do they, do they look at this with a slightly different eye? Um, I mean, COVID is part of the story, of course, uh, but so is clinical workflows. Uh, backlog, I think, in the U.S. might have been a little bit bigger than it was in, in Canada, but of course, uh, it's impacted uh, populations on both sides. Um, so I wonder if you can speak to that a little bit. Are, the, are your, you know, your, your customers a little bit different, coming with a little bit of a different eye, whether you're talking to the U.S. Uh, folks or, or Canadian uh, customers? Sure. I, I think this is where both of us could comment on it. So I was like, I was just wondering, but I... I Honestly, with the pandemic and the strain on all on everybody's resources, we're hearing the same thing over and over again. It's like how how can how can you? It's almost like how can you make it? How can you help us alleviate this backlog? So they have different 
funding mechanisms for sure, but the strain on resources is prevalent, I would argue, globally, right? Like healthcare resources are right at their limits right now. And so anything that can be used to increase capacity, improve efficiency, and also alleviate the burden on staff and providers. And that's one of the things I haven't mentioned is that you now, with, with, with WIRE, the patient's in hospital for six hours, and there's a nurse that has to take care of that patient, but has no ways of alleviating the duress that she's under, right? She's got the work. She can't do anything for her other than calm her down and give her, you know, a, a lot, which is extremely vital and important. But until the wire comes out, she can't alleviate that pain. And so this is where that burden of having to take that 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 burden on the care providers and having to just alleviate a little bit by decoupling is going to be amazing. And and, and I think that's some of the benefits that that Molly Molly is trying to bring to the market. Yeah, the need is the same. Um, it's a global need. But Dorian, as I'm sure you know, the funding models are just different on both sides of the border. And so it just comes down to um, operating within the funding constraints and working with the institutions in partnership with finding um, a way to uh, fund it through their structure and their mechanisms. And that's that's really the only difference on both sides of the border. But the need in the, the clinical um uh, operational requirements around it, they're the same on both sides of the border. I was trying to get to that point too. Yeah, I imagine uh, it's a slightly different uh, decision-making process, at least from uh, from that uh, perspective, financial perspective of this. Uh, but of course, uh, when we're talking purely about a, a clinical perspective, patient experience perspective, um, both sides uh, definitely need uh, you know improvements on those uh, skills. And so I'm really glad to hear that this is making a huge impact on, on the clinical side, on, on the patient side as well. And I think one of the other pieces that I really love about this story and about what the company is doing is that it's a, it's, it's a Canadian company. And I believe this is in one of the press releases as well. You know, it's, it's homemade, if you will. So from the Sunnybrook adoption perspective, it was awesome that it was developed there, adopted there. Uh, and now it's actually expanding to, you know, the rest of the world. Um, and I'm wondering if that's part of the vision as well to kind of keep it as a, uh, a homemade, a Canadian made uh, kind of product that is then branching out uh, and offering these huge benefits to patients across uh, uh, across the world. Yeah, so Molly was born out of a, a need within breast surgery, and our near-term focus is to establish Molly as a standard of care. Uh, we're in North America right now. That's where our focus is going to be for the next bit. Um, I also just want to echo what Anand said earlier, that Molly was born out of the value-based Canadian healthcare system. So it's got the Canadian healthcare system's imprint on it. And what that means is that really provided that perfect framework to innovate for greater efficiency and cost effectiveness. And that, that focus um, really helps us address the, the global need here, that more patients um, can get the care that they need more quickly. So um, we're, we're absolutely... Um, focused uh, here with the, you know, built-in Canadian um, value-based principles that really bring global benefit and gives us the opportunity to, to go move globally when we're ready to move beyond North America. Right now, we're really focused on, you know, implementing Molly, bring, making it the standard of care here in North America. And looking ahead, um, there are other finding needs in other surgeries. And at its core, Molly is really... Um, a finding technology that's been cleared for use in soft tissue. So our FDA clearance and Health Canada registration is not just for breast, it's for all soft tissue for use anywhere in the body at all. And um, we're already seeing um, opportunity and and interest through uh, the the hospitals and care teams that we're working with to be able to implement and use Molly um, beyond just the breast. This is a really good uh, point I wanted wanted to ask you guys about as well. Um, So are there plans now underway to uh, expand the use of the the Molly Circle, the existing device, uh, in terms of uh, other tumors or other sites? Uh, And then do you also have plans to actually grow the company, build it into a a multi-product company um, focused on maybe... uh, uh, oncology type of uh, devices or something beyond that? Yeah, what I can tell you, uh, Dorian, is that Molly Surgical is not a breast or even a women's health company. We're not an oncology company. Um, what we are is a solutions company. That's how we were born. It was out of a patient voice. It was out of that patient need. And wherever that patient voice and need is, um, is, is where we set our vision uh, for simplifying healthcare so that more patients can get the care that they need quickly. Um, and so I think that we're just really looking for those opportunities 
um, to be able to elevate um, and improve the patient experience in a way that hasn't been possible until, um, you know, until now, just like how Molly came to be. So there's a, I think there's a lot of other um, procedures like wire, where there's a lot of inefficiencies, data technology, it was revolutionary at the time, but it just hasn't gotten the update that it needs to improve that patient experience. And because it's just not easy, it's not easy to solve from technologically. And those are the kinds of um, problems and, and areas that our team excels at. But it all kind of starts with really listening and learning about that patient experience. And now that you're embedded in, if you will, in uh, in hospital systems, that that's a direct kind of line of sight to how what some of the problems are uh, that clinicians and patients are facing within a clinical practice directly. And so maybe you know I'm kind of hinting maybe there's a uh, an opportunity there to kind of use that feedback and uh, further improve or or. or or iterate on this innovative process that you guys have uh, set out on. Um, and so, you know, I would definitely look forward to seeing a lot more to come. And I'm also interested now in, uh, do you have any upcoming studies um, or uh, conferences that uh, that you're looking to present new information related to uh, the Molly device or or maybe anything else that might be coming up in, uh, in the pipeline? I, I think for future studies, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. We are we are actively engaging a, a, a number of our, our early adopters and, and our, our our customers to again we're targeting studies around democratizing wire free technology, democratizing wire free localization, and enhancing that care. And how do we get into the hands of many? Um, and 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 then in addition to that, we're always on the look for novel ideas and. We have a, a skunk works in our in our in our um, in our company, always dabbling in, 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 in with innovative technologies. But to Fazal's point, it, they all stem from that important clinical need from the patient. Um, and so we've got a number of things, and it's going to be exciting. Just um, we're definitely coming out with new things, and I, I, I look forward to coming back and, and chatting about those next time, Dorian. <laughs> As I mentioned, our focus is really on helping Molly to become that standard of care right now, bringing it to that standard of care. We're, we're excited and frankly, we feel privileged to have this opportunity to bring um, the, the benefits of Molly of making that precision breast um, surgery easier on patients in their care teams that was first envisioned and identified just in one place in a very small conversation began with one patient providing feedback saying, gee, I just did not like wire. And the hospital listening and taking that to, there's gotta be a better way. It was born from that very simple conversation. And we wanna, we're, we're honored to be bringing that now to multiple patients all across North America. But right now about building that and really build, building it as the standard of care, I strongly believe that that access um, comes through patient education and partnering with advocacy groups who've moved beyond raising awareness to action for breaking down the barriers to access to quality health care, like socioeconomic barriers that we hear about a lot, especially in the U.S. This is something we talk about on my show, Breast Practices, quite a bit. And um, we, we're there to help amplify their work in their communities. And so the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because when patients are really educated about their options, then they are empowered to make the choice that's right for them. And I want to give you an example, lumpectomy um, versus a mastectomy. This is a, is a question that many patients struggle with. It's a very emotional, very personal decision. And there is no right or wrong answer. If, many patients um, with early stage breast cancer will be eligible for making that choice. And that choice is often a double-edged sword. It's great to have the option, but how do I know which uh, one is right for me? And um, the, the opportunity to have that choice really does rely on early breast screening, as I mentioned, because as the tumor advances, and if that breast screening isn't um, being uh, occurring early on, then you really don't have the luxury of that option anymore. And again, the education around early breast um, screening is so important so that women can truly get um, the option to make the decision that's best for them. In fact, a new study out of Sweden showed that there is a better survival 
for lumpectomy versus mastectomy. And that's causing quite a bit of controversy right now because, and, and Anne can speak to this more, the conventional belief has always been that um, you have equivalent outcomes in terms of survival and recurrence in most cases for lumpectomy and mastectomy. Now there's this new study out of Sweden that's saying, no, actually when you correct for socioeconomic factors, that um, there's better survival for a lumpectomy over a mastectomy. But the marginalized populations, they're disproportionately having a high mastectomy rate because of access barriers. And that's why we really believe that patient education is what can help change that. We're playing, we're doing, uh, I have a weekly show on breast practices where I bring together the breast cancer um, community, everyone from the patients to the physicians and care teams to the innovators and the patient advocacy groups where we're really tackling the question of what does it really mean to have patient-centered care? And I actually think it's a bit of a strange question that we're asking because wasn't healthcare always supposed to be about the patient? I'm glad you uh, added that little plug in um, of us love breast practices. Um, I have taken a look at it uh, for our, our listeners and viewers. Uh, you can take a look at it. There's a YouTube channel associated with it. We'll include a link in the description as well. Um, great, uh, great set of conversations uh, that you've had. And as you were uh, talking about the patient experience, there's another piece that um, we haven't uh, touched on uh, very much yet, but um, it, there's also a part of the patient experience is going to be the cosmetic aesthetic uh, component to this as well. Um, going back to also the, the, the related to uh, lumpectomy versus um, uh, mastectomy. And so I wonder if you can also speak to that a little bit. Is this part of the feedback that you're getting from uh, directly from, from patient groups uh, or from patients themselves? Feedback in what sense? I'm not sure I understood the question. The, the benefit in terms of uh, the, the cosmetic or aesthetic aspect of using um, a, a device like a wire-free device uh, versus uh, traditional kind of wire uh, devices. We're hearing it from our, our surgical colleagues and, and, and surgical customers. So the number of surgeons, I did mention that they found that the distance reading gave them so much more confidence to reduce the amount of tissue that they were removing. Um, and, it, and the fact that it's now all embedded within the breast and they don't have to follow the wire for, that the radiologist has put in all the way through, they can plan the optimal surgical path and plan so that you can hide the scar and do new, not new, but like better cosmetic approach for that patient. So, you know, in that sense, it gives them the ability to, and then one surgeon actually I told you is, but my practice is going to improve because of it. And it's because it gives them that facility to no longer be linked to radiology and where the wires flowing in the breast and they can create a plan that's customized and again patient centered but customized to that patient so it's patient specific so we, they can hide the scar if they can or they can find an approach and remove just the right amount of tissue to make sure you get rid of the cancer but provide the best cosmetic result for the patient again really great to hear i think that's one more major benefit to uh, to, to the model e. Uh, surgical device. Now, this is uh, this has been a really fascinating conversation. I think we kind of took it full circle. So we kind of looked at, you know, everything, how the company actually got started. Um, 2018 is actually uh, not not that far to actually go from uh, idea conception from a from a patient, a bit of patient feedback all the way through iterative uh, versions of the product, uh, and then all of a sudden full adoption into centers like Sunnybrook and, and others beyond that. And, uh, you know, the full commercialization process is underway at this point is actually it's, it's pretty incredible. I think you guys have really uh, gone through this process very quickly and, and with a lot of success. So I'm very happy to hear about that. I'm really glad you were both able to join uh, the program today and uh, answer some of these questions about you know, benefits to patients, clinicians, and to the hospital systems. So thanks so much for, uh, for joining the program today. Anand Fazila, it was a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation as well. Thank you.